Um, hi, so I'm Ben, as he said. I work at Google Zoo as a creative technologist. And I'll explain a bit more about that in the next couple of slides. So the title of my talk is called Take Play Seriously and Make Serious Things Playfully. And what I mean by that is having fun and doing work, to me, is a continuum. It should be one or the other. When you play games, sometimes you're having fun, but you should also analyze these games and take it seriously. And when you're um, making things, you should make, have fun when you're making things as well. So roughly my talk is going to be about prototyping, Google technology, and a bit of like career, not really advice, but kind of the path that I've taken, and maybe that might uh, ring some bells with you. So here are the contents. I'll go through a bit about um, my background, what I do now, and then the Google tech, as I said. And then I'm going to deep dive a little bit more about AR Core, and then a bit about prototyping. There'll be time at the end for questions. Just before I start, just a really quick disclaimer. <laughs> um, some of the things that I'm saying, part of it comes from Google, and part of it's kind of my own opinion. So there's a mix of the things that are in there. And when in doubt, please, please read the official documentation. Things change very often. So some of the things that I put up might be a bit old as well, and things change all the time. OK, so a bit about my background. First of all, does anybody know what this is? Put your hand up if you recognize this. Yeah, OK, cool. There are some people that are a bit older. <laughs> so this is kind of like where I started uh, with an old 286 computer playing nibbles.bass. And QBasic was the first programming language that a friend of mine showed me when I was in high school. Um, so kind of DOS is kind of where I started. Uh, oh, it's really hard to read the text on the screen here. Okay, But anyway, I started before there was the internet. So I had to learn programming from books. I had to borrow books from the library and literally copy the code from the book into the computer. All right? There was no Stack Overflow back then. You had to learn yourself. Okay? Um, so I went on to university, and I studied software engineering. So my background is very technical and writing code. And uh, you know, started as self-taught, but then you know, went through this path and like, got jobs uh, while I was at university in internships, working on products. Uh, I wrote a spam filter. So I started off in kind of like probably non-creative uh, roles and eventually found myself uh, working at a digital agency uh, when uh, Flash was around and mobile apps came out, iPhone came out, and all that kind of stuff happened. And I, and I realized, well, this is a lot more fun and this is kind of the path I wanted to take. And then I ended up in advertising. So I worked for an ad agency for five years. I started as a mobile and web technologist, which just means developer, basically. Uh, went on to this role called creative technologist, which kind of exists only in advertising. But more and more, I see uh, there are courses for this now. You can learn and then study to be a creative technologist. So I'm not a game developer, so I've, I've, uh, but uh, I would say I have created some games. So here are some of the examples of some of the things that I have created. Some of these are prototypes, and some of these uh, were from Game Jam. So I'll go through quickly. The Empire of the Sun game was probably the first uh, game I worked on on the iPhone 3GS when that came out uh, that actually made it live. That was for a band, so that was really cool. Uh, when the Oculus DK1 came out, uh, there was a game jam that Oculus held. And I made a really silly game called The Hunger Game, which was basically Pac-Man, but in first-person view. Um, and basically, I did it just because it was fun, as I mentioned before. Like, you should have fun when you're making things. Uh, I once worked uh, for three months freelance at home uh, for a games company building a uh, isometric game engine for a farming kind of game, which never saw the light of day. But I spent three months on it, learning all kinds of things like pathfinding. And it was really, really cool fun as well. Duck, Duck Goal was something I made at a game jam with some friends of mine. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was over a weekend, and it was five of us. And uh, we produced this game that's kind of like Rocket League, except with ducks in a bathtub, and you kicked a little football around. Very, very silly, but a lot of fun, and learned a lot of things from making it. Uh, Krispy Kreme Donuts was one of our clients uh, when I worked back in Sydney. And it was a game that was enabled by Microsoft Connect, where basically you think like whack-a-mole, but you had to use your hand to kind of slap these hands away from donuts. Once again, very silly game. It was for a real client. It went live. It lives in a Krispy Kreme store somewhere in Sydney. So super fun projects. So that brings us all the way up to today, where I work at Google Zoo in London. And the zoo is a creative think tank for brands and agencies. What that means is we work with brands such as um, Nike, Adidas, Ford, big brands across all kinds of different verticals. So it can be automotive one week, cosmetics the next week, food the week after. It's very, very job. Uh, it's cross vertical. So in the department I work in, we have creatives. We've got creative technologists, strategists, data analysts. And we all work together to solve briefs for these brands using Google technology, which is a very, very broad thing. Um, we work across uh, multiple countries as well. 
So uh, this year we launched a new methodology that's very much based on design thinking. For those of you that might not have heard of it, it's very much about human insights and we're building things for human beings. And they also have to be technolog technologically feasible and that's where the creative techs come in to help with that. And also economically viable. So kind of these three points are very important. At Google we also talk very much about user first thinking. It's very important to us. And from design thinking, uh, Google had this concept of design sprints. So how many of you are developers here? OK, we've got a couple. So in, in the development world, we talk about sprints and agile methodology and uh, all that kind of stuff. Design sprints is a slightly different kind of process where it's about bringing the right people together in a collaborative environment and trying to solve a business problem. We've then taken design sprints, which is meant to be a five-day process, and at Google Zoo, we do what's called machine sprints. So this is a new thing that we're doing this year, uh, where it's a bit more flexible. It doesn't have to be five days. And we listen to the client's briefs, and we use the design thinking process called a double diamond. So imagine two diamond shapes. We start here, and you listen to the, uh, to the brand's uh, problem that they're trying to solve. So it's called the empathy section. And you do expansive thinking. So you listen, and you go expansive, and you listen to everything, and look at all the data that's available. So our creative analysts and data analysts at work, they look at um, search data, YouTube data, trends that they can find from multiple sources uh, to, to analyze what, you, what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And then we get to a focus, and then we do expansive brainstorming. So what Google technology can we use to try and solve uh, the client's problems? So MACHINE is an acronym that stands for Mission, Audience, Challenge, uh, imagine, nutshell, and execution. So from that first point of listening, we end up ideally at a prototype that the creative technologists would normally build. And ideally, we test it in front of real people as well to prove that that answer can solve the, the initial problem that the clients brought to us. OK, now we'll go into the fun stuff. So Google tech for games. So when I started looking into it, Google has so many technologies that we've got. And it's impossible for me to go through every single one. And the more I dug through it, the more and more that I found that was applicable to game development. So there's a lot of slides coming up. I hope you're prepared. <laughs> so I'm, I kind of split it into three main sections. The first one is immersion. So we say VR can take you anywhere, and AR can bring anything to you. What do I mean by that? When you put on a VR headset, it's taking you to a different place. You could be on the moon. There could be dragons flying around. Your entire sense of vision is being surrounded by a virtual world. Augmented reality, on the hand, can bring anything to you. When you're holding your phone up and you're using, doing an AR experience and pointing at the ground, it brings digital elements into the real world. And it's mixing the two together. So I think most of you probably know this already, but I thought just to give a bit of um, background, the first DK1 by Oculus came out in 2013. That's five years ago. And we've gone through this long journey of all different kinds of headsets. Some of those are from Google, obviously. And then uh, in the future, I know Magic Leap is already out now with the developer version, but you know, I assume there'll be more to come. And uh, at Google, so we've got um, the Daydream. Has anybody used the Google Daydream before? Hands up if you have. Cool. So the idea that we were taking with that is we would make it made of material, make it softer, because I, at the end of the day, it is a wearable, so it's got to be comfortable in your face. And with the Daydream, you have to put a mobile phone in it for it to work. The, the headset itself has no technology in there. Uh, there is, of course, the uh, hand controller that you can use to point at things, and there are buttons on there. In this case, it's a 3 DOF, so only three degrees of freedom on it. Now, where VR is at, uh, OK, one of the examples of work from Google Zoo using the Daydream was uh, for Fantastic Beasts. So this was a campaign of an idea that started at Google Zoo and eventually became a big project that went out and was a VR experience. And also, um, I think that's a laser on this thing. Yeah, excellent. Cool. So Fantastic Beasts up there. And also, it had an integration with Google Assistant, where if you said um, some magic spells from Harry Potter, like Lumos, the uh, flashlight on your phone would turn on. So that was like very bespoke first party integration into Google's uh, platform. Um, so where VR is advanced to now is standalone VR. So the advantage of a headset like the Mirage Solo um, is that you don't have any cables. You don't have to deal with base stations. You don't have to put a phone inside. Everything's built into one unit. So in my office at the moment uh, in London, we've just got two headsets in. And it's um, really, really fun to play with. And I love the fact that I don't have to plug in multiple cables all the time and calibrate the room and do all this extra setup. And it just makes it so much easier and quicker to get into an experience. And we've started looking into uh, Unity and how we can uh, develop um, some prototypes using the hardware. Sorry. 
So here are some examples that exist um, on the Play Store at the moment. These were not from Google Zoom, just going to clarify. I know these both are two examples, and they're both snow-related, but there are other games out there that are not snow-related. Um, the snowboarding game was really cool. That was one of the nice ones that I tried, where you can stand and you can actually move your body back and forth, and you can duck and jump. And in the headset, it actually knows where you are in space. So if you think about the HTC Vive that has base stations, and you can walk around, this headset can do similar to that, but in a smaller uh, area around you, basically. So compared to the Daydream, the Daydream only has three degrees of freedom. So it doesn't know when you're moving your head from side to side or forwards and back. So there's been some new developments with the Mirage Solo that came out that was uh, announced very recently. I think it was last week or the week before. So there's this extra faceplate that you can uh, attach to the front and six degree of freedom uh, hand controllers and two of them as well. So what was really cool that they also announced at the same time in the same article was pass-through mode. So you can see here, it's playing table tennis through the headset. So that's just basically showing that it's fast enough that you can do that. So I've used some other headsets in the past before with see-through mode, and it's very laggy. But they've achieved this amount of speed now on there. And you can see here some augmented reality going on. So you can place virtual objects and see them through the headset. Um, this isn't available publicly yet. It's something that's being worked on at the moment. But it's very exciting that this is um, possible. Um, some other features that I announced was the fact that you can run uh, Android apps in there in 2D in the VR space. And that's Chrome running there. Um, the talk before, if anyone was in here about the uh, Jedi Challenge AR game, they mentioned uh, Resonance Audio. So this is an SDK that developers can use to uh, create spatial sound inside VR experiences or even other experiences. It's cross-platform, works on uh, iOS, Android, Unity, Wise, FMOD, all the usual gaming uh, platforms for audio. Uh, there's also a demo. Uh, called Audio Factory that Google created to kind of show off the capabilities. Very cool, this kind of low poly kind of look to it and just shows off um, environmental 3D sound. Definitely use your headphones when you try it out. Uh, how many people in here use Unity? A couple, okay. I thought there would be more. Uh, I use Unity a lot. I find it, because uh, I've been using it for a while now, I'm familiar with it. So in terms of prototyping, to me, it's very quick to produce something in Unity. So. I think I did this on the first night here after I landed. I downloaded the Unity plugin for uh, Resonance. And uh, this is the demo that comes with it. Basically, that green box there is an emitter of sound. And you can move that box around in the scene. And I had headphones on, and you can tell where the box is. So when you click on it, the box moves to a random place. And even though you can't see it visually on your screen, you know where it is because of the sound. And it, it was very quick to set up. So you can imagine if you've already got that as a demo program, you can take that code and take the prefabs and put it into your own games. Um, how many of you have heard of Poly by Google? Yeah, this one is a bit less well known. So it's a website where it's full of 3D assets. I know there are lots of other 3D asset uh, kind of uh, websites on the internet, like TurboSquid. Unity has its own asset store. So Google, because we're looking into VR and AR, and when you're creating these things, you need assets for them as well. So with AR, we were going for kind of the more low poly look because of um, we're using mobile devices and we're trying to reduce the strain on the on the hardware. So here's a place where artists can upload. Uh, 3D assets that they've created. There are plugins into your uh, 3D programs like Blender, Cinema 4D, Maya, 3D Studio Max. And straight from those programs, you can upload straight into this website, Poly. And most of these assets are Creative Commons. Definitely check the licensing before you start using them. But if you're just creating prototypes, this is just like a giant library of all kinds of stuff here that you can use for prototyping. And potentially, you, know, you could, I guess, modify them and use them in your final production uh, games as well. So once again, uh, okay. So in Unity, there's a there's a plugin you can install as well. So it comes with this little interface here, and you can select the assets that you want and drag them straight into your uh, your uh, whatever this bit's called. <laughs> uh, once again, I downloaded the one of the examples. So not only can you load the games in uh, sorry the assets in edit time, you can also load assets in runtime. So this scene was actually empty when I started. And I, I modified some of the code, and when I hit play, in this case, since we're being sponsored by Wargaming. Uh, I searched for the word tank. And so these are all the assets that came back with the word tank in it. Uh, Thomas the Tank Engine. There are some actual tanks, aquarium tanks, all kinds of different things. But this is all loaded at runtime. So that, I think that's quite powerful, and that's actually quite exciting, and opens up a lot of doors to imaginative and creative ideas that you guys can come up with. Um, Thought I'd show a little bit of code, since I thought I wanted to make this like a bit technical. It's just very simple code. Uh, so it's there. There's the keyword, tank. 
Uh, this is uh, object here that you create for the request. I'm saying I want them to be curated. Uh, the complexity filter, medium. Uh, what else? Blocks uh, is the, uh, it's another platform by Google where you can create 3D objects in VR. So I said I only want objects that were created by blocks. Uh, sort order, and then how many results per page. Uh, do this, and it gives me back a, an object with all the 20 assets that I've requested for, and then I can just instantiate them in my Unity uh, scene. Super simple. Uh, and, and all that code is in that demo package that you can download from the website. All right. Uh, second section I want to speak about was machine intelligence. So it's a very hot topic at the moment. And the first example of um, using machine intelligence I want to speak about was the Google Assistant. So the Google Assistant, some people find it hard to um, think about what it is because they think of the Google Home. But really, the Google Assistant is software. It lives in multiple places. So the Google Assistant is where I can take out my phone and I can say, what's the weather today? I can say, what's the, what time is the next train to wherever I want to go to and ask it questions. I was very surprised one night when I was playing a game at home and I couldn't get past a certain level. And I asked Google how to get past it. And it basically did, uh, sorry, I asked my Google Home and I asked it how to get past. And it actually did a Google search and told me in one sentence how to get past that level. So it, I thought that was amazing. Very helpful. <laughs> Um, so the Google Assistant lives in multiple places. So it can live on your phone, the Google Home, there are speakers, so other third-party brands are creating their own hardware and embedding the Google Assistant into it. Uh, TVs, cars, smartwatches, and the smart display is quite a new thing now. So it's got a screen and you can speak to it. So imagine if you were in your kitchen, you were making a cake or something, and you wanted recipes, you can speak to it, set an alarm, all that kind of stuff. Why is this interesting for game developers? because there's this tool called Dialogflow. So this is a website that lets you create third-party actions on Google. So for example, at the Google Zoo, we created something called the Nike Coach. So you can say, talk to Nike Coach. And after answering a bunch of questions, it'll recommend you a shoe that's uh, specific to your needs for running. Uh, there's also a lot of brands doing interactive games on there. So think about basically, uh, we used to have choose your own adventure books back in my day. I'm pretty sure they still exist now. But you could do it in audio form as well, right? You could get to a certain path. It could be a narrator with a recorded audio speaking the story to you. And at some point ask you, would you like to take the left path or the right path? And the, the story can branch from there uh, in an audio only experience. Or on your phone, you can also have pictures or videos or animated GIFs on there. So it's another platform where you can create games, basically. One of the examples of a project I worked on last year was for John Lewis in the UK called Moz the Monster. It was an interactive story for kids. Uh, slightly funny and frivolous in a way that one of the questions would ask you is, what musical instrument would you like the monster's fart to sound like? And it would make that sound. So if you said trumpet, it would, make a tr it would tell you the story. And at the key point, it would make a trumpet sound for the monster's fart. That, that's just one example of the interactive bit that was in it. Um, another thing I worked on, so I tried to pull out some uh, game-related examples of work uh, that, that we've done at Zoo. So for Tomb Raider, uh, this was for the movie, actually. Uh, we worked on a campaign for, and we created an escape room in Camden uh, with the help of a whole bunch of other people, obviously. It wasn't just us. And uh, we got the Google Assistant uh, built into an old-timey radio, and people actually had to go up to it, press the button, and speak to it to solve the next puzzle. To, to go on with the escape room, basically. There's a bunch of videos online on YouTube of influencers and media people going through the escape room, super funny. Uh, and they also use assets from the actual movie as well. It was um, really cool. Only a limited number of people got to do it. Uh, I was very lucky to be able to be one of them. Uh, OK, so we've talked about speech now. I mean, uh, and then the next bit I want to talk about is vision then. So, so what if the machine could see things and it could understand the world? So a Cloud Vision API is part of the cloud package from Google, where um, you give it an image. So for example, if I had my phone out now and I took a photo of this room and I sent it to this Cloud Vision API, it would give me back information of what was in this room. So it might say people, crowd, camera, hall, light, or whatever, and also give me a percentage rating of what it thinks, uh, like how sure it is that object is in the scene, basically. So uh, this was an example. I just uh, quickly found this picture in my computer and did this. And I thought, you know, internet cats, relevant. Um, yeah, so I guess like a lot of mobile games are doing this. Uh, not a lot, but uh, it's being used more in mobile games rather than desktop, because it makes more sense, because you've got your phone and you can point it at stuff. Uh, more machine learning stuff, so TensorFlow. So the, the Cloud Vision API is quite easy to use. 
But if you want to get a bit more in depth, then you can get into things like TensorFlow. So then you need a bit more knowledge about neural networks and all that kind of stuff. It's, uh, to be honest, out of my depth. Like my, my level of knowledge of this stuff is still quite low. But uh, this is something from Google called uh, the Teachable Machine. So this is a website where it takes an input from your webcam and you can train it to do different things. So let's look at this top section here. When you press the train button, he's doing some kind of action to say when he does this, trigger this thing. So if you imagine this is input and this is output based on this action, this action, or this action, it's actually very s doing lots of really smart things behind the scenes, but all packaged up here that you can use it so easily by just going to this website called Teachable Machine just to prove the point. But it's up to you guys to come up with ideas how you can use this in other ways in your games. Um, more things that are coming out because of machine learning. So we've had the Microsoft Connect for quite a while now to detect poses, and you've got um, all kinds of games that need pose detection. This is being done with a normal RGB camera from uh, a laptop and running from a website. So I think that's pretty impressive and shows you the power of machine learning and neural networks. So it's giving you all these different points of the body. Um, and this is some example code in HTML. It's importing some JavaScript libraries here. And just in this block here, it's being able to give you the pose of, I think in this case, it's an image. Yeah, you can see it's sending an image there of a cat. Yeah, I don't know, something about the internet and cats. All right, uh, here's an example of work from Google Zoo using machine learning. So once again, game related. So we worked with Ubisoft uh, for the Assassin's Creed game. Uh, and uh, we helped them come up with a campaign where we wanted to crowdsource um, gathering data of hieroglyphs to help them train a model that could then recognize and translate hieroglyphics. So this is ongoing work at the moment. Basically, a website got created that would show you a hieroglyph. And it's asking the user then to, to trace it and draw it out to create more training data for them. And the eventual goal is to be able to translate, that, uh, to be able to translate any hieroglyph into English. And I think that's a really awesome project. We had some researchers reach out to us from Australia. They were really excited about it. And it's actually a useful tool for them in their real day-to-day -day research. OK, next section is context. So it's about storytelling, things that are relevant uh, to you and the user. So of course, we have maps. Everybody uses this almost every day to find out where they're going. But all this data is available also via an API. So as a developer, you have access to this rich, rich, rich information of the real world that you can use for your games as well. Obviously, Pokemon Go is the biggest example of some kind of a maps-based, location-based game that's very well known all around the world. Uh, there's also a Places API, so it can tell you where there are restaurants, where there are bookstores, where there are museums and parks. It has knowledge of all these things and opening times of all these places as well. So there's all this rich information you can use to enhance your game. Uh, routes, places, so you can say, you know, from point A to point B, which path can I take? How long is it going to take? And you can use that in your game as well. Maps Gaming API, very specific to gaming. So obviously, off the back of the success of Pokemon Go, uh, we wanted to help developers create their own games as well that are uh, maps-based. So using the Maps uh, Gaming API, you also get 3D information of buildings. So for example, in, in London, uh, there are lots of very strange shaped buildings. And when you use the Maps Gaming API, you actually get the actual shape of these buildings given to you via this API. So I've tried this in Unity, and it's uh, really easy to use. It's got lots of examples in there. And it gives you all this 3D information uh, that loads at runtime. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not available to anyone yet. So William Gibson, a really cool cyberpunk author, has this quote, the future is here, but it's not uh, widely distributed yet. So it exists, it's there, but not everybody can use this yet. So at the moment, there's a big forum online that you've got to fill in to get access to this. Uh, but here are some examples of, uh, of what it, it might look like. So this is normal Google Maps, and it, it's got all this information on there. When you use the Maps Gaming API, because you know where these things are, you could say, OK, where all the bakeries are, put some kind of 3D icon of bread. And maybe that's a pickup, like you know, as part of your game, some kind of power up. Out of the box, this is what you get. You get unskinned uh, buildings and roads and paths. And uh, to help you skin this unskinned world, you can use uh, techniques such as nine slicing to help you. And you can say something like, OK, all the bookstores, color them red. So you can put these rules in there to help you skin the entire world. Um, here are some more examples, so more advanced. So this one is more kind of a low poly look. This one's a bit low poly as well. But you can start doing things like this using procedural methods to start filling in that unskinned world that you saw before. Because you can also get topography and the mountains and how high and low things are. So super cool. Uh, at the moment, the games that have launched using this are Jurassic World and The Walking Dead. 
So last night we were walking around playing this and uh, kind of testing it out a little bit. Ghostbusters hasn't been released yet. I'm actually really looking forward to that one. And there are other partners signed up to be using this as well. Uh, Ghostbusters actually very recently released some more uh, videos of their gameplay. So there's, there's the Maps Gaming API being used here and then also an augmented reality uh, section as well. You guys are probably familiar with this kind of uh, method of doing this type of game from Pokemon Go, where there's these two uh, tech methods being used for the game. Okay, and that takes us to the next section. So I want to talk a bit more about AR Core because it's uh, like a hot topic at the moment, I would say, augmented reality, even though it's been around for a while. So AR Core is uh, from Google. And you can use it now on Android and also iOS, which uh, is really cool. So it's cross-platform. And it, as I said before, augmented reality lets, lets you bring digital items into the real world. Um, so the three main features of it that we speak about, one is motion tracking. So as I have my phone up and I walk around, it's tracking the motion and making sure that the digital asset that I'm looking at is staying in the same spot. It's got environmental understanding and light estimation. So one of the examples is this Lion app here, which some of you might have seen before. It's not available publicly. I do have it on my phone upstairs, actually. Sorry, I should have brought it with me so I could demo it. Uh, in terms of the light estimation, when you have this Lion standing there, if you turn off the lights, it knows, and it'll change to a different animation, and he'll be scared. So that's one of the features that you can also get from AR Core. Uh, this is another example. <laughs> Uh, it can also do this, so it could detect, uh, detect a marker and then overlay a 3D digital asset on top of it. Uh, there's also shared AR experiences. So this is a game that's in the Play Store at the moment. What it's allowing to do is play a multiplayer game in augmented reality. So the user is placing this 3D asset on the ground in front of them, controlling one of these cars. But then you could have a friend of yours come along, open the same app, sync up, and also play the same game and see the same 3D asset sitting on the floor as well and play the same game together. Uh, so I, I was talking about prototyping. So here are some of the random things that I've created. So out of the box, this is what you get. This is like the simple demo. It's uh, looking for planes, so vertical and horizontal. And you can tap to place these 3D assets. But it's so easy to just replace those 3D assets with whatever other 3D assets that you want. So these I quickly did in Unity. So it's just some random 3D models I got from online. Obviously, in Unity, you have physics as well. So I just kept tapping to create more of these Oreos falling on the ground. Um, and then I started going a bit further and started making some more random things for prototyping and just to learn how to use the AR Core SDK, basically. So here you can see uh, some ships flying around. You can shoot them. And I just had like a simple score counter. I mean, these were nothing for production. They were just prototypes that I was just doing just for fun. Here you can see a, a robot in the middle of the floor. And uh, it's got this kind of glass refraction shader on it. And as you walk closer, this uh, dissolve kind of burn effect happens. So you can actually see it kind of reminds me of a predator a little bit. Um, OK, cool. Uh, so here's an, a video of the lion. So it's also got pose detection. So you can see my colleague here doing this pose. And it's detecting that. And the lion is copying what he's doing. So that goes back to that pose net technology that I was mentioning before. So even though I speak about all these different technologies on different slides, think about combining these technologies together and what you can do with it. Uh, this is AR stickers, which is available on Pixel phones now. There's also uh, like Stranger Things characters on there, and they react to each other. It's really, really cool. So not only can you place items, but if you put two different characters together, how might they interact with each other, and what different animations could they trigger? Um, some more examples of augmented reality. So from Wargaming, the World of Tanks, which is uh, available now. Very cool. Uh, BMW, so brands are using augmented reality in interesting ways as well. This is similar to the AR Spectate that you guys all might have seen outside. So this is uh, from a TV show called Nightfall. They created an AR experience where you're defending the castle, and there's bad guys coming from this way. And you've kind of got to shoot them and defend your castle. And you can place it you know, in, in uh, your lounge room on your coffee table. Super cool. All right. So what is the point of all this? All these are just tools to, to help you, right? You still have to come up with a creative idea. How might you use these things? So I think like. Um, I think by doing. I like to open up Unity, download these SDKs, play around with it, install, poke around, change numbers, delete code, add code, get code from somewhere else, put it in there, just to see what happens. To me, this is all play. It's fun. You know, I love doing this stuff. I used to do it a lot more, a bit less now. But I used to just spend weekends, like um, late at night, just writing code and creating ridiculous and frivolous things like this. 
Here are some, some more examples of some random things I've created. So I've showed you the Hunger Game before, so that was VR. You know, very early on when the Oculus DK1 came out, AR Core, uh, Leap Motion. So we, there was a Leap Motion talk earlier today. So, you know, I'm just, what am I doing this for? It's just for fun. I'm trying to learn how to use these new technologies, this new hardware, new SDK, new software, or whatever. Uh, this is using the Razer Hydra. I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's like a controller that's um, wired and you can like um, turn it around and there's buttons on it. And so I was just I just made a silly game where like raptors would run at you and you had to shoot them. And of course, being gangster, you got to do it sideways, right? Um, yeah. So and I think this I might have combined that with VR as well. So then you could be in the environment interacting with your hands with um, digital objects. Um, why? Why prototype? Sometimes it's for tech feasibility. So sometimes someone might come to you and go, hey, I've got this crazy idea. I want to make this thing. And you go, well, I think that's possible, but I'm not sure. What's the quickest way that I can find out if it's possible or not? If I can't find some article online, if I can't find it on Stack Overflow, just jump into the code and try and find the quickest way from A to B to prove whether something's possible or not. Um, why else? Because it's fun, because you innovate through play, thinking by doing, as I mentioned, uh, to convince clients and stakeholders. So sometimes you come up with ideas with your creative teams and you go, yeah, this is really cool. And you have it on a piece of paper or maybe it's a slide deck somewhere, but you show it to a client and they don't get it. They're not sure if they want to buy it or not. What if you could create a pr prototype and just show them, especially things like VR and AR, like to explain it in words. It's just not the same as when you put someone in a headset and you actually show them your idea that you're trying to convince them to buy. Um, so here's an example. So from creating this really, really silly game at a game jam, uh, I was working with an insurance client at the time, and we created this VR experience. Uh, was it the DK? I think it was Oculus DK1 at the time, so it's quite old. Uh, put it in the car. There was hydraulics in the car, so the car moved as well. So it would move up and down uh, depending on you know, where you were in the scene. Everything was on rails. You couldn't control the car. It was basically to show the difference between a car from 30 years ago and a car from now, and the difference in safety features. So there were creative insights that the guys worked on beforehand to reach this conclusion. Super fun project. Uh, we, it was released in, in the public in Sydney, so people could come in and try it. There were really long lines. We put it at an event called the Easter Show in Sydney, and one of the comments that came back was, there's too many people waiting here. Only one person can try it at a time. I think it was a two-minute experience. The client said, how can we get more people in there? And the technical request to me was, can we get two people in there at the same time? So can we get two headsets running out of one PC? And I said, I don't know. No one's done it before. I looked up forums, uh, opened up the code, found a found a place with the flag, turned it on, and yeah, managed to get two Oculus in there running from uh, one PC. So really, really straining the graphics card. But that then uh, won, uh, well, I got nominated for an award. It took me to South by Southwest to give a talk. SIGGRAPH, I got invited there to show off uh, the technology as well. So from here, silly game, took me to these places. So I guess I'm trying to say you should prototype lots of stuff, make fun things, because you never know where it's going to get you. Um, so yeah, please go forth, use your creative and technical skills with these tools to make new and innovative games. Thank you. Do we have any questions from audience? Don't be shy. <laughs> Here we go. Hi. Uh, you were showing that the uh, pose net uh, that was recognizing body position from the video. Yes. Was it completely real time or was it getting -time. better over the time? I mean, because the video was yeah. looping, so. Yes, sure. That's real time. Is it if learning you... and getting better or is it. Uh, I don't think it's any learning. So it's, all, it's, a, it's a model that's been trained. So if you have a laptop now, you can just like look it up. Uh, what's the name? There's a website called Move Mirror. So they're using that technology. And uh, if you go to the Move Mirror website on your laptop, open it now, turn on the webcam, you can try it straight away, real time as you move. You can see all the points on your screen, on your laptop from Chrome. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not sure if it works in other browsers. Any more question? OK, thank you. Big applause. Thank you.